Welcome to Mason Creek. This is a world-renowned fossil site in the middle of rural Illinois. This is my third time visiting Mason Creek, and I think I know where to find some good fossils. I boarded my kayak in a small lake at Pit 11 and set off for a forested peninsula. Of all the fossils found at Mason Creek, one stands out above the rest. Had you visited the area thousands of years ago, you might have caught a glimpse of the elusive Tullimonstrum gregarium, a creature with eyes on stalks, a jaw on a long proboscis, so strange that even scientists don't know what to make of it. This was my chance to find a Tully monster. There are a lot of different challenges associated with fossil collecting here at Mason Creek. One of these is just simply finding a place to collect. The problem is this is a huge nature preserve. There's a lot of lakes, but where do you actually go to find stuff? I've had the best uh, success by going out into the lakes on our kayaks and trying to find places where there were these exposed rocks and then going nearby. Now, sometimes you could see them from the lake. You could see, oh, there's a hillside that's all kind of rocky. But actually, I found that using Google Earth was quite helpful. I went on Google Earth and looked all around here for different places where you could see a tan color that indicated exposed rocks. And then we went to those sorts of places uh, over the water and climb up and try to find those areas. But first, we had to land. And that was a little more difficult than you might expect because the water is fairly deep right next to the shore. And the entire shoreline is covered in reeds that go out 15 to 20 feet from the shore. So you have to kind of break and bend your way through lots of reeds or find an opening to get back to dry land that you can actually stand on. Now you've got to climb up some steep hills down through some little gullies, and then back up again to get to the fossil collecting area. The reason why there are so many exceptionally preserved fossils found here is because this was once a coal mine. You see, down here underneath the ground, there was a huge coal seam. And right above this coal seam, there were lots of other rock layers, but the important one is the Francis Creek Shell. And that shell layer was right on top of the coal seam, and it contained lots of different fossils. And so to get at the coal, the miners had to basically break up this shell and dump it somewhere. And this mound that I'm standing on here is actually one of the places where they dumped all the shell and the rocks and fossils that they found. On some of these barren kind of exposed hills, you can sometimes see places where other collectors left all the la little random broken nodules they didn't want to keep. But this is a great place to kind of see what these nodules are like. They're reddish brown, and the reason they're that color is because they're made of ironstone, technically called siderite. It's an iron mineral, and that red color that you see is basically because the iron is rusting as it's exposed to the air. When you find them and they haven't been broken open for very long, what you'll see is that the outside is red, and inside it'll be more of a kind of grayish color. The growth of these nodules occurred in waterlogged sediments. These shell layers that these nodules are found in had not yet solidified when the nodules were forming. So you can imagine inside you have a lot of pore space. The individual grains that would later solidify into rock were still separated by a bit of space, and that space was filled with water. So the iron in that water slowly precipitated out over time. And usually it has to form around some sort of nucleus. That nucleus could be a fern, a shrimp. Sometimes it's a coprolite or poop. In some cases, fish poop. And after that, they begin to kind of form these concentric rings around this nucleus. I find that the best place to look for fossils is not those barren kind of rocky outcrops, though. It's often beneath them in the trees and the brambles or in kind of little wooded uh, gullies or thickets. And the reason why I think is because those places where there are exposures are, there's a lot more fast erosion. So the nodules that you will find are more likely to be broken to bits and because those are a little easier to get to and so collected more thoroughly and people kind of take all the stuff there leaving you without anything. This is another good little hillside to look for fossils on. There's lots of uh, 
I, I find a lot more hole nodules here than I have in some other places. I found a few here that you can see here. Uh, some of them are already split open like these three. This guy here looks like it might be a little jellyfish. Uh, and then here's a nice kind of round unopened one. All right, so right now I'm just here kind of rooting through all the uh, dirt and stuff on this hill trying to expose some rocks. So often they're kind of partially buried and so I can kind of use my pick to dig a little bit and expose them if need be. Ow. <laughs> Most of them are of course broken already and then you can usually tell if you have something in them or not. That's a, that's a fairly nice little nodule. I don't want to go for ones that are too small. Ah, there's a nice one. See, this is the sort of one I'm looking for, where you got it nice, it's, it's pretty thick, and it just got this nice, round, big shape. These are often going to have like jellyfish or shrimp in them. And this is actually the spot where I found my Tully monster. And this was originally just lying on the ground like this. And I picked it up because I thought it was a kind of interesting, kind of strange shape. And I turned it over and I realized it was already broken, right? So the other piece here is missing. And so the surface here was all kind of dirty. I've cleaned it a little bit since. And I couldn't see anything originally on it because of how dirty it was. So I almost threw it back. But I decided to keep it just because it was unusual shape. Right here is the jaw of the Tully monster. And then back here is the torso. And you can see here there's a band where there were those eyes. The first fossils of the Tully monster were found back in the 1950s. One day, an amateur fossil collector named Francis Tully was out here collecting, and he found a concretion, but he couldn't identify what that animal was. He took it up to the Field Museum in Chicago, and even the scientists there didn't really know what they were looking at. They'd never seen anything like it. Well, a couple years later, the curator of fossil invertebrates at the Field Museum actually described his fossil and named a new species in honor of him. The species was named Tully monstrum gregarium, and it's kind of a Latinized version of its famous nickname, Tully monster. Now, Tully monsters didn't get their name because of their size. They're not very large. The smallest are about three inches in length, and the largest are just a little over a foot. About 14 inches is the biggest discovered. Now, we know that these animals were soft-bodied, and we know that because in the nodules, what we'll often see is that their bodies are crumpled or twisted in weird ways, indicating that this is a soft, fleshy creature that's kind of being uh, wrinkled up. They did have some harder parts. Their claw on the front of their, I guess you could call it their head, was a little harder, and that eye stalk on their back was a little harder as well but generally they were soft-bodied animals. The Tully monster appears to have been a marine animal living in the salt water of the sea or ocean, and we can infer that because it's found down here with the other animals that also lived in this marine environment, and it's not found up by Braidwood where there's the more fresh water and terrestrial environments. The jaw of the Tully monster is lined with all these little sharp tooth-like structures. We don't know exactly what they are, but it's clear that he was using this to attack his prey, whatever his prey were. We, we think that Tully monster was a predator because he has these sharp teeth-like structures, but we don't really know what he ate. Some people have suggested maybe he was eating jellyfish. Others think he was eating shrimp. But scientists think that that jaw was not used for chewing. It was used for grabbing and holding on to whatever it was eating. The Tully monster's eyes were mounted on this bar that kind of went across its back, perpendicular to the rest of its body. So it had this bump on its back where this bar attached to the back, and then it just kind of stuck straight out. It doesn't appear to have been real flexible. It seems to have been more like a kind of stiff bar that just stuck out either direction. It had these round, beady eyes on either side of its body. In some fossils of the Tully monster, you can see a light or whitish rod kind of running down the back. And some people have thought this was a nauticord, 
a feature indicative of vertebrates. However, this interpretation has been called into question because others think that this could represent some kind of internal organ running down inside of the animal. Scientists have also noted that animals that we know are chordates, like fish and other creatures found here at Mason Creek, do not show a similar rod going down their back. So what exactly is the Tully monster? Well, that's something that remains unclear to scientists. Back in 2016, it seemed like we had gotten a definitive answer, because two independent groups of scientists each separately came to the conclusion that it was a vertebrate. However, since then, there have been a number of different rebuttals, and as recently as 2023, yet another paper has suggested that it was definitely an invertebrate. So that remains unclear for now. The Tully monster has been assigned to many different groups of animals. Some people thought it was more closely related to lampreys and hagfish, so jawless fish. Other people have claimed that it was some type of carnivorous worm. Yet others have claimed that it was a shellless mollusk, but it remains very unclear exactly which of those groups it truly belonged to. For now, the true identity of the Tully monster remains a bit of a mystery. Hopefully further studies will continue to tell us more about this strange creature that once inhabited Mason Creek. Thanks so much for joining me on this fascinating journey to Mason Creek. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe so that you'll see our upcoming videos. Thanks for watching.